and ho <laughs> and hopefully this time it um does the thing. Okay, hit start. Hello and welcome to another episode of Loose Cannon. Uh, Hello we and welcome to another episode of. Just did this, and uh, my my I I have the stream open so I can see chat and stuff, and it said unexpected video error, video not showing, and I thought the stream wasn't getting it. It's just I wasn't getting it. So. <laughs> We're here. We're trying to be professional, and we're going to have a good show. Uh, this week, we are going to talk about the new lore book, which I don't actually even know the name of. <clears throat> I know it's. I know they changed the name of the first year Festival of Lost Lore Book, and then made this one that name, Part 2. But, hmm, sorry. I didn't. I we usually title this episode the one about insert lore so book. Is this is this not read in the dark? Is this or it's like read in the dark one and then two now? Or no, did they no. Rename... So that's that's a name I give it because uh. of the. <laughs> did you ever read those books when you were a kid? Scary yeah, stories to read yeah, in the yeah, dark. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah, I was that's gonna a, say that's funny. Yeah. So I did that last year, and I wanted to do it this year as well. And because of that, I don't even know what the hell the lore book is called. And uh, I'll just be honest, I'm not, I don't have the patience to be collecting candy anymore, but I do love these lore <laughs> books. So even though I won't have them in game, I'm very happy to have them on Ishtar and to get to talk yeah. about them here. They are, they are good. Um, it's just like, it's funny how, it's just funny how Festival of the Lost has become a parallel thing now to the lore. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think about what do you think about the way that they're presenting this right now? Just real quick. Like the lore books themselves or Yeah. Yeah. I mean the lore books are great. We we, we I feel like we talk about this every week. Um I'd like them to be a little detached from the story. I'd like them to be a little more um accessible. Like the way that it happens now is that it's it's like <clears throat> Do the mission, get the book, do the mission, get the book entry, do the mission, get the book entry. I want more like collectibles or just like more, more, I don't even know how to describe it. It's just like more agency to go get it all at once. <clears throat> but at the same time, I don't like the the candy grind because the first year I actually played like quite a bit of festival and I think I only got like half of the pages for the lore book and I was just like man that sucks and then this year it's just like okay here's a whole new lore book and also if you really want you can finish off last year's so it's just like it'll be like so do I get half of the new book this year or do I finish off yeah. last year's book yeah well and so like they up the candy bar that you get playing so like I've noticed you've got you get more candy each time you do a run uh, I think that maybe that's why, because now they know you're splitting your time trying to. Catch but I mean, it's not just the candy though. You're you're looking for the pages. Yeah, and the pages. Uh, I think I did two. The very first two three runs, I got two three pages. Yeah, and it's like for me, like with the pages, it's just like do do the activities that have gotten like no attention in years. It's like do strikes again. It's like yeah, I already did the strikes. Right. I don't need to do the strikes again. I already did them. So I'd like I it, it's a little harder to want it as badly. Yeah, exactly. I get that. I think a lot of people are in the same boat. That's why I kind of brought it up real quick because I've mm -hmm. noticed a lot of people I've noticed the the community right now we're at that lull spot just where people find themselves not wanting to play as aggressive normally. And uh, I thought Festival of the Lost would be like a huge insert. You know what? I, people. I, I jinxed it because it's happening again. That uh, the mic thing. Yeah, that mic thing. Oh no. Well, all I was gonna say was that you know I think that kind of the same thing where we're running into content drought, if you will. But it's funny that it happened on a Festival of the Lost. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been happening for a while, and it's just, and now there's the festival, and it's like, you know, in next season, it's going to be dawning, like literally, like next month, it's going to be dawning, and it's it's going to be the same exact 
not not that dawning is going to be the same exact thing although i'm sure it hasn't changed much but it's just like i also don't have the patience to go fucking make cookies either like it was fun the first time <laughs> it was really fun the first time and it's okay if that's yeah. all dawning is like it's not like you need to give us a new holiday event every every year that's asking for too much right but it's like i don't know there's a lot yeah. of fatigue yeah, I get you. It, 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 it's like the motivation. Where do you find the motivation to go all the stuff a thousand times before already? Mm-hmm. <sighs> well, let's let's not be a downer about it. Yeah, because, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Lightfall is coming, and I mean, I, I'm I'm very I'm very optimistic with Lightfall. I think there will be like a lot of um, good change coming from Lightfall. So. Oh my we'll god, yeah. I mean, of, of, of course, we've got a ton to look forward to. I mean, this yeah. whole event that's coming up, you know, later. And we still have the dawning. Are we going to get the dawning? Oh well, yeah, I mean, there's no reason not to. Um, I think that was part of the I think maybe not part of the reason, but I think they were pretty happy with how it panned out uh releasing Witch Queen in February allowed it so every season has a seasonal event. So, season 1 has um What's the the one the 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 used to be Solstice now it's uh Guardian Games. Season oh, 1 yeah. has Guardian Games, season 2 has uh whatever the EAZ one is. Is that one Guardian Games? No, that's not Guardian Games. Those are different, right? Yeah, different. Uh what's that one called? Age of uh, Triumphs? Triumph? Yeah, Triumphs or something. Uh and then season 3 has Festival of the Lost and season 4 has The Dawning. Holy crap, I never <laughs> even paid attention to that. I even yeah. popping up quarterly now. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, that's it's probably just like a happy accident, but I'm sure that they're they're okay with it. And I think they've actually mentioned like that's all there's going to be. We're not going to try to to do any more than that. It's going to be your your fall, summer, winter, and spring holidays or events as they are. Well, all right. So you want to do the lore card? Let's do the lore card. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, this one kind of exploded because uh, DMG Community, our, our, you know, our leader in charge at the moment over at Destiny, uh, retweeted it, so it like blew up. <laughs> I wasn't used. I'm not used to these lore cards getting so much attention. <laughs> no, you deserve more attention on them. You put a lot of work into them. Well, it's just funny because um, <laughs> I probably it anyway. It's just funny because like. Uh, Sometimes I'll put two, three hours in some of these because I go on a tangent rabbit hole, sends me into crazy areas. And it's good because I find some really good nuggets that tie to destiny. And I kind of feel like I kind of feel like all of a sudden I'm sitting next to the person who wrote the, the little flavor text or described the whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so and so um, I get I get I get help, too. So it's cool because I feel like I'm I feel like all of a sudden I see what the person that authored it talking about. Yeah. And then and then sometimes I completely miss the mark. <laughs> well, but uh, uh, but it was funny cuz on this one there wasn't really a whole lot of like crazy tie-ins. It was just a really kind of straight arrow hit the mark. This is all it is. I mean, you could go down technical manuals and, and all kinds of medical stuff, blah, 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 blah. But this one was just straight up, just here's the definition. This is what it is. And uh, and it probably took me 45 minutes at the most to put it together. And then this one just blows up. So it's like all the other ones that I spent so much time on, just, you know, yeah, 20, 30 likes maybe here or there. But then this yeah. one's just like, boom. I didn't even, I even forgot to tag it. <laughs> That's what you should do. Don't tag anyone. Yeah, I guess that's what's happened. Maybe that's it. Maybe the Twitter algorithm these days doesn't want you to put hashtags and tags. Well, you know, like um, the Twitter algorithm <laughs> next week is just going to be give them eight dollars a month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, I already well not on this account, but unfortunately, I already I already have Twitter blue. Really? My main yeah. I just do it because I like to. I like to. Uh, what was the thing? I like the. Um, there's the edit button. 
now. Yeah. But before that, it was the, um, oh, heck. Yeah. Was it the ads? Like, I don't even know. I, I yeah, genuinely yeah. don't know what they offer. Yeah, it's not It's not as bad. The ads aren't as bad, and your, and your feed isn't constantly full of just a bunch of stuff you don't follow. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, we'll see what happens now. We're going to have new monarchies. <laughs> oh, I got to tell you something after the show. Remind me about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, so this little card is the... Sparrow you get from the King's Fall raid, the revised Destiny 2 King's Fall raid. That's a sweet uh, sparrow, too. Like it that's, is. That's a cool. really good-looking sparrow. How do you even get it? Because I don't have it. I'd imagine it's, it's uh, through a triumph. Let, here, you, you talk and I'll look it up. All right, anyway. So this one is called Ossian Earth Carver. I'm not like a massive raider. Do it casually. Anyway, the uh, flavor text is carve your path through flesh. <laughs> so um, the first word, Ossian, is where the definition goes. It basically, Ossian is the honeycomb-like structure and extracellular matrix of bone. Uh, the osteoblasts are the cells that synthesize bone matrix, and coordinate the mineralization of the skeleton. So, like, it's very, you know, medical. <laughs> it's very scientific, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but if you look at the sparrow, it's kind of cool. You can see a little bit of the Ossian matrix, I guess, if you will. And then if you relate it to the way all of the King's Fall weapons look, uh, there's a theme. And you can see how the bone is growing, like they describe in the, in the flavor text, through flesh and steel. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there's still, like, the red marrowy flesh bone is kind of and then of course the the sparrow i don't even see any pieces of sparrow anymore on this but technically would be well Those. i mean it's sparrow made entirely out of like chitin yeah and so that's the other thing is chitin we know that hive are very much made of chitin and chitin is cellular matrix of many ocean life if you think about seashells and crabs and other ocean animals that have hard shells uh chitin is the protein that forms around their you know soft flesh underneath so that's an inside out type of thing so if you think about the king's fall you think about oryx and you think about the hive and you think about all of that they have chitin which is this hard exoskeleton that grows on outside of them much like ocean life Mm -hmm. But it's hivey hiveness, so it's not specifically that they're crabs or anything. Just they have this material that, and so a lot of times it's described as like a bony matrix, it's like these bone protrusions that stick out. But the hive is chitin, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what else do we know that has bone in the game? Think about the Ahamkara. That's like the first thing we all. And then there's a, a little bit of correlation with the speak between them. They both have like a little bit of the whole O'Bearer mine dialogue about some of the lore entries. And I just thought it was funny how a lot of the King's Fall uh, weapons and now the Sparrow that just showed up all have the same kind of theme. Mm -hmm. Bony intrusion out of these red flesh marrow So, Ossian is the first time we get like a more medical definition for a lot of those weapons because everything else is just named after the hero or you know failure of the raid, I guess. <laughs> All the other weapons like uh, you know uh, Yasmin and I can't even think of them all. Uh, the different people that were uh, attributed to those weapons. But here's what's cool: when you take the word Ossian. Um, it's like I said, it's the organic extracellular matrix of bone. Is that honeycomb like structure that builds the bone? Mm -hmm. um, this is crazy because in order to isolate the Ossian matrix in science, you have to use hydrochloric acid and boil it at a certain temperature, and then it will remove everything but the, let's say, inorganic, inorganic material. Uh, 
So all you're left with is this calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate. Uh, this substance is used <laughs> in the in industry for the production of like gelatin and bone glue. So like, you know, you're familiar with everybody says, oh, you're going to turn the horse into glue, that type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, like, yeah. So what we what we fail to recognize is they're not specifically taking bones and grinding up glue. It's the actual fleshy material around the bone that they extract to use because when you manipulate it chemically, it becomes this really strong that's used widely everywhere. Also, they don't use bones to make jello. Bone, it, it, it's not the bone that, that makes the jello, it's the cartilage and like the flesh stuff around the bone that's left over that they make jello from. I don't know if anybody ever told you jello is made out of bone. It's specifically not, but it is. That's just a funny jello. Anyway, medically speaking or scientifically speaking, osteoblasts are the specialized mycin uh, chemical cells that synthesize the bone matrix, coordinate the mineraliz mineralization of the exoskeleton. Um, Osteoblasts require substantial amounts of energy, particularly during states of new bone formation, remodeling. It produces the osseous proteins that are making the bone, and the formation of the same takes place. So, aside from the whole glue thing, osseous is also known as the production of glue, but deproteinized bone residue left after the removal of osseum can be used to produce other things like bone ash or bone china. Uh, and then the byproducts are carbonized bone char. Use it for dyes, pigments. So talking about, you know, using every little piece of the bone, right? Or, you know, having something go down to the bone it's funny how all of that bone that we speak of isn't even really the substance that's being everything around. So what's left when you've dissolved everything around the bone, all you have is the structure of the bone. So like when you dissolve uh, an animal, human even, in, in uh, acid, all you're left with is the bone at the end. It's because that bone is so impervious to outside um, erosion or chemicals, that's what you're left with is that calcium and that phosphate structure. And so you're able to see inside the bone all of that honeycomb-like matrix. You're able to see what specifically the bone is made from. And it's just amazing that, that animals and humans have this ability to make us internally. But also you look at the way that ocean life makes its chitin it's the same but specifically inside out and so chitin is made almost in the identical way it's just backwards so how does that how does that relate to uh to uh, the raid i was thinking about oryx and his inside out day <laughs> and how the chitin is their bone structure how he basically pushes his throne world inside out and they dubbed it. In. But I hmm. thought all of these little things, all these little connections are neat because writers and authors, real life topics and science to kind of use as guidelines for world building. So King's Ray raid uh, weapons and armor and Pharaoh, bone. <laughs> <clears throat> awesome. Uh, so I was right. For those wanting to get this, it's a very tough uh, ask. Um, you need to complete all the challenges in the master tier of King's Fall. So the challenges are themselves kind of difficult, but then you have to do them on master. And you have to do it for each encounter. And if you were to complete the King's Fall raid on master difficulty, whether or not you did the challenges, as long as you did it, 
uh, you would also get the ossified sky carver, which is the ship that kind of goes along with the sparrow. Yeah, that's a cool one. Um, but so on the King's fall note in King's fall there, uh, in the original King's fall back in destiny one, after the jumping puzzle, when you were, uh, in the final landing zone, the jumping puzzle with the, uh, the hive ships, that big doorway used to have banners going down the side. And on those banners was this little, uh, circle image here with the aura around it. And it's not there in the remake. And I thought they just like took it out of the game entirely. But then I got lucky and I, I this morning I was playing and I was, I finally saw Cathedral of Dust because I haven't seen it once. And I came into the center room and I was like, oh shit, there it is. So it did make it into the game. Um, and I just think it's interesting that they, they like in the remaster, they, they got rid of it. And it's still here today. I remember thinking back in D1, I used to think it was, um, it would symbolize the fundament. Like, this is the fundament, this big, this uh, big world. Yeah. And, um, today a clanmate of mine, uh, suggested maybe it actually is the syzygy that it's referencing. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense because of like the halo around the planet, you know, it's, yeah. That's what I thought was an, it was an eclipse. I didn't, you know, specifically say syzygy, but I, I thought mm -hmm. originally when I first saw it, it was just trying to say it's eclipsing the. Uh, uh yeah. So I, I, just, I just, when when we got onto the King's Fall topic, I just wanted to bring that up really. Yeah, no, that's well. a good that's a good thing. Yeah, because uh, um, you know that all that's relevant now. I mean, we just defeated Savathun, and so kind of like. What's going to be next, right? Yeah. Where are we headed next? Because specifically speaking, back to a couple of episodes ago, we were talking about how you brought up there's not going to be any more hive. Yeah. <laughs> so where what are we going to see next, right? I don't know. It, it's just funny how like there's no way to produce more hive now. That whole machine has been knocked down. That whole hierarchy, structure pyramid scheme <laughs> whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it has been <laughs> toppled and for those who who uh aren't picking up or, or forgot or whatever um it's specifically the fact that within Savathun's throne world was the worm larva incubation chamber and based on how they talked about it that was the only one they they literally put all their eggs in one basket and it was Savathun's basket and not only did Savathun betray them but also, we destroyed it. Which makes sense as to why they were trying to come up with a way to circumvent. Yeah. I like, think system. And it, it was actually a two-part uh, destruction because uh, I believe Rolk was also kind of important for that to even work. <clears throat> because in the uh, Vow of the Disp Disciple raid... Uh, I forgot her name, but the original worm worm god, the mother of the worm gods, who created the worm larva for the hive, the krill's ingestion to become hive. Um, she was there, and it, you know, I don't know the extent of exactly what we we knocked out, but we 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 did a number on the hive. They are a uh, they're a finite number now. There's not going to be any new ones. Any new ones are not born with worm larvas in it. They're born regular krill and have to have a worm larva given to them. So it's, it's actually, I'm actually really excited to see if that's something that gets addressed or if they just go like, yeah, there's a whole bunch of hive out there. There's like a billion hives <laughs> that we can pull from. <laughs> yeah. Cause that, that is well, also a very like in the scope of things possibility where it's like, yeah, of course, there's billions of hive. We'll never run out of hive. It's, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, in, in, you know, I think like the loophole or the back door that they give themselves always this paracon ability or that the light can somehow be attributed to new entities or mm -hmm. the darkness can be attributed to the, so like what's to stop, um, I don't know the witness or the darkness behind the witness to, bring up some other way. Well, I mean, this was the witness's whole thing in the first place. The, yeah. the worm larva. So it's like, it's kind of, it'd be really kind of shitty to be like, or actually, you know what? That, that does make sense because 
I don't think Zivu understands that it was the Witnesses doing that brought the Hive to the Worm Gods in the first place. So it would it would it would kind of make sense if now that the Hive are finite, that the Witness would swoop in and like earn brownie points with Zivu to be like, hey, don't worry, I have a backup plan. <laughs> yeah. And Zivu is probably the best one to have that happen to, because if it were, if it was like, if Savathun was the last one and the witness comes in and is like, Hey, don't worry. I have a backup plan. They'll no longer be in a worm contract and they can kind of just do whatever they want, but they'll still be really powerful. Like Savathun be like, what the fuck? No, like you don't get to do that for them. But Zivu would be like, Oh no, no, they're going to enter a me contract and I will kill them. <laughs> you know, like that's how Zivu is going to operate it. If, if that's what pans out. Interesting. All right. So, do we want to get into this lore book? Yeah, let's get her. These uh, these Festival of the Lost lore books are very long. They have uh, 27 entries of both this one and the original. We're not going to go over the original because we already did an episode on that. Um, but they're short entries. They're kind of just like uh, anthology as well, where it's three groupings of nine entries that each tell their own story, but kind of all involve the same uh, topic and theme. Last year, it was Glint proving the existence of the Headless Ones. And this year, it's Ido kind of trying to understand the origins of the Headless Ones. And so that's making me really excited for next year, uh, which actually I think I wrote in to say at the very end of this. But I'm very excited for next year to see where this story goes. Because of that. Um, so yeah, uh we're not gonna we're not gonna read uh every entry. <laughs> because even though there are they are short, there there is twenty seven of them. Uh so it would take a little too long. But there's a few uh parts in here that I do wanna read, uh just like verbatim. But so sure. um I wrote summaries on each section, and the first section is uh, called The Drowned Captain. And so, the Drowned Captain section follows Ido as she tries to piece together the truth from the tales of an infamous House of Dust captain named Faison. Which is a... Do you think that's how it's pronounced? Faison? Yeah. Isn't that like an Italian thing? (laughs) I wouldn't know. I would not know. It almost sounds like Egyptian. Oh, I know why Maybe. it's fucking ringing a bell in my head. Donald flies on from like Scrubs. Uh. <laughs> he played Turk. Cause I I read it and I was like, man, that's a that's a word that my brain already knows, and it's not. I mean, I guess it was a name, but that's on me, I guess. Um. But so Faison gained the title of the Drowned Captain by hiding beneath dark waters in weight of the enemy, then leaping out and killing them with their blades. However, according to the Drifter, it seems that uh, when he tried this on some guardians, he tripped and fell on one of his own blades, and then the guardian <laughs> killed him. Yeah. And, sorry? No, I was just saying, nice, way to go. Yeah. So you're you're quickly gonna see that um, the drowned captain might not be all they seem. So they actually like have a, more like a python. <laughs> That's the word. <laughs> That's the word that I was thinking of. Oh my god, the python. Um, they actually have a limerick. Um, <clears throat> so uh, drifter sees. Uh, Drifter sees Ido reading odes written for the drowned captain, and he goes, You reading poetry? I got one for you. Drifter said mischievously and cleared his throat. There once was a fallen named Faison, who took on a team of three light spawn. He saw they were armed, and he spoke with alarm. If I knew we would fight, I'd be long gone. <laughs> and uh, so I don't know if he made that up on the spot or if he was prepared. But so Drifter's having a lot of fun with Idol Ido in this. Um, but the story of the drowned captain doesn't end there. I mean, it began with the Lixney, and so who else uh, to talk to 
other than Mithrax. Um, and so, like, Mithrax claimed they were a buffoon who constantly made mistakes and even damaged their own catch in attempting this, like, ritual with, like, bombs. And Spider kind of corroborates Mithrax's take on this, and he calls uh, Faison a liability. So this is, like, back when Faison was still alive, he was a liability to the House of Dusk, potentially the House of Kings, because he is loyal to Krask. And um, I don't know if it was during the King's era or during the Dusk era that he was a liability, but he was basically tar- told to uh, guard a hole. So real important work for Faison. But so um, the ode that uh, Ida was reading, there is another tale that claims he was actually betrayed by one of his own, not not that he fell on his own blade like a buffoon or a liability, but that he was stabbed in the back by a dreg and then heard the voice of the witness calling him to stand. <clears throat> and so they give you the entire ode in the Drowned Captain number six. So I'll read that. I tell the tale of the Drowned Faison, House Dust Captain with his sword drawn, on the machine spawn and cabal, and with our house our captain led against the legion risen dead, our foes ahead, Faison's call. But drowned Faison had at his back a betrayer's lunging to attack, and one sack soft coward took sharpened knife and drove it through Faison's armor and others too, violence and new empowered. But dead and still, a whisper came. It spoke of terror, undone shame, violet eyes aflame. Ether gone, a tongue of fire, a screaming head, a creature made of seething dread. As it is said, drowned Faison. So that's that's the ode. But in in an an earlier entry, and I'm trying to find it now, uh, it actually says... Uh, however, just as his victory was assured, the Elixni hero felt the blade slide into his back between his lower arms, a dreg's knife sharpened by betrayal becoming became his undoing, and so Faison of the House of Dusk slid beneath the water once more. So like that's like the actual uh, effect, and this is saying that he became a headless one. <clears throat> right. And I don't remember where I got that it was the witness. I might have just made that up by accident <laughs> I, I i could have sworn there that he heard the voice in the darkness oh yeah there it is oh right, no i wrote that one just dropping a little rasp yeah it was then so the house Faison of the house of dusk it's entry seven Loyal to Crass, Kell of Kings lay betrayed as his life ether flowed into a murky water. He heard a call. So this is after he was betrayed. This is another, like, this is actually what happened. It was not the call of his Kell, nor of his dregs. It was one of, it was not the call of the great machine, nor that of the awoken prince. It was the call of the voice in the darkness, which bade him to rise, reborn and remade, and inform both ter- terrible and terrifying. As Faison rose, no longer of House of Dusk, He roared with flame that poured from his mouth and eyes, and his spirit longed ether no more. Okay. Anything to add there? Well, no, I just like that they're kind of um, bringing like a almost, it's not a new concept, but it's like a, they're kind of planting a seed here because if you think about Faison rose, no longer House of Dusk. He roared with flame that poured mm-hmm. from his mouth, and his spirit longed for ether no more. So, like, I, I take, I take, um, I take that last bit. His spirit longed for ether no more, and correlate that to the other. Immediately, I think, why would they put that? What's relevant about it? about all of our our enemies of the darkness trying to break their their uh their tendencies. Minds. Yeah. yeah oryx did it with yeah um Sabbath let's just... 
<laughs> I can't tell when you're about to talk because you don't have a camera. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sorry. It just I, my mind is 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 like just going all over the place because I start thinking about how like you're connecting the every, dots. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's how I work. <laughs> same, absolutely, man. Same here. And I, you know, that's that's why the show is called what it's called. So um, if you think about that, if you think about that, F- Festival of Loss is like a really funny kind of typically not super serious but they love to throw things in there that are either like little what do you call it foreshadowing or Mm -hmm. little secret tidbits about what's coming up next and and it always seems uh funny how every new thing that's put into the game there's something somewhere buried in there that's about to show you i mean they do it all the time they do it constantly Mm. uh but you'll stumble upon them and then just almost go, what? Wait a minute. And then when the new season comes out or the new content drops, you're like, oh, that's what they meant. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's just like the whole, I mean, it's just like it could just point to so many different. Things. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, so it just makes me wonder if this doesn't tell us a little. Yeah. And so uh, it seems likely that Faison wasn't a hero at all based on the, um, the likelihood that a fallen captain actually became a headless one after being called by the witness, after Mithrax's testimony, after uh, uh, Spider's testimony, after what Drifter said. Like, we have all these people who are like, no, 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 no. this is what happened, this is what happened. And if you had to pick any of them to believe, at the very least, it's like Mithrax is probably rather trustworthy and ultimately it's just like everyone's agreeing he wasn't what the the legends say yeah and so he probably just died whether it was as drifter said or as the story said and he was betrayed and he just lucked into folktale hero status but so so like how does that so (laughs) i hate to be this person but so like how does that correlate to the rest of the story because like you like we were saying you know festival of loss is always like this little parallel story it's okay. like a little micro story about what's going on in the game or well so so obviously um ido this season especially is really like proving herself as the scribe of house house of light and looking into the histories and so she finds this history of paizan Faison, damn it. (laughs) (laughs) Finds the history of Faison and is like, oh my God, what's this? And probably went and like asked around and then are like, oh, I know this story. Go talk to Glint. Goes talk to Glint and he fills her head with headless ones. And, and so she, she runs off to figure it out. And, and as I said, at the start of this, she's looking for the origin of the headless ones and so she's starting with the fallen, but is quickly being debunked, right? It's like, no, 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 Faison did not become a headless one. He's an idiot. He was guarding a hole. He was playing with bombs. Like, and that right there, you know, the fact, let me actually pull, find the entry. Uh, so he goes, uh, Faison was Mithrax. This is Mithrax. Faison was incompetent. He once blew a hole in the side of his own catch, attempting the right of six hands with a live grenade. He was a buffoon. So it's like that right there could be where the whole uh, fire and all that. It's like, oh, he br- he breathed fire that one time. Yeah. It's like, no, he was an idiot playing with bombs, and it just the story took its own like uh, took its own whatever away from there uh so that then the last entry of this is it's like so unrelated it's a ghost story from uh glint being told to ido and it's completely unrelated to uh uh the drowned captain i'll just i'll just read it really quick yeah two guardians were riding a sparrow through the edz glint began ido typed into her data pad they were both on one sparrow, she asked, flatly, not looking up. Yes, Glint said. They stopped at the side of the road, not because the sparrow broke down. Or, they stopped at the side of the road because the sparrow broke down. One went to look for supplies, and the other waited inside and locked the doors. The sparrow had doors? This one did, Glint <laughs> said. And they were locked. 
But then the Guardian heard a scratching at the door. From outside, Ida stopped typing, watching Glint with interest. And a voice said, let me in. And the Guardian opened the door, but there was nobody there. Glint bobbed in the air, whispering a trem- tremulous ooh. And, Ido asked, Glint stopped moving and glanced back and forth. That's the end, he said. Ida's notes were brief. <laughs> so I love I love entries with Glint because he's like yeah. nothing but like optimism and enthusiasm. Yeah. And he's a fucking child. Yeah, he is. It, it's funny because Glint's like this... Uh... <laughs> All wrapped up in this whole, uh, keeping this and pre- perpetuating this whole headless one, yeah, you know, boo oogity ghost thing at all cost, yeah. no matter what. And and last season he was really getting like like uh, dismissed. He was like, "No, these are real. The guardians fought them, and we were." And people were like, <laughs> "Shut the fuck up, Glint. No, no, they're not. They're not real." Um, and yeah. so kind of piggybacking off of last season we'll, we'll touch on it again glint came to the conclusion that the headless ones were some in some form connected to the hive and so part one of the series is are they connected to the elixir and that was debunked and then part two is are they connected to the cabal because <laughs> ida ida is uh, responsible she's doing her research yeah, well, you know, Ido is nothing but, if not, you know, thorough, right? Because yeah. she wants to make sure she archives it correctly, the way that she sees most with none of Glint's flair. Yeah, with the most <laughs> factual information. It's it's great because Glint, with all of, all of the craziness surrounded around Glint, Glint um, shines lights on things that nobody had noticed, before, even mm-hmm. though he's going through this crazy. Involved headless, you know. Well, and, sorry, go. On. Yeah, <clears throat> no, and so I just think it's funny how even the most lightest of humorous characters can often bring you or shine a light on things that. What do you call? It? Boom in your face! Oh my god, yeah. I didn't notice that. the eureka moments and yeah, there you go. The revelation. Yeah, revel- revelatory things can be found yeah. even through the the lightest of. And you know, you saying that really, this is this is what I was about to say a second ago. You saying that really just made me realize, and this this story was basically written for me, because this is what I say all the time. I am Ido. I am the one who's like doing the research, and it's just like, wait a second, no, this is disproven. It can't be this. And then I'm gonna go to the cabal and be like, could it be the cabal? And then eventually that'll be disproven as well. Okay, so it can't be the cabal. <laughs> And Glint is everyone who's too afraid to say to share their theory because they're like, oh, but I don't, I don't have a YouTube channel. It's like I don't care, you know. Like, <laughs> tell me, tell me what you're thinking. Like, give me your opinion yeah. on it. You can, you can see something that I would have missed that everyone has missed, and I say that all the time. And that's like, that's that's what Ida's kind of doing here. She's like, you know, Glint, you had a, a bit of a weird story, but I think you're right. I'm gonna look into it more. And that's then it's great. That's what's great about this. No, I was just going to say that's what's great about this because it's one of the things that's wrong. Say wrong. One of the flaws of we tend to talk more than we listen, Mm -hmm. that type of thing. And so even even if you think you know, or if the thing that's happening in front, what you're hearing can oftentimes you know drone you to death or sound as boring as humanly possible. Blah blah blah. Every now and then, if you just listen, you're going to hear something. Yeah. It's going to really go counter to what your pre prejudgments, whatever, you know, your, your biases, stereotypical Mm -hmm. pre thoughts or whatever you had about this, what you already made up in your mind to be fact can often be, you know, tested when you just listen a little bit, even to the most. Uh, annoying of characters, right? And that's in life. Just listen a little bit. You might get to... And, and deep down inside, you might feel like you already know. <laughs> yeah. And maybe you are true at the end of it all, but at least you come out of it with a effective found fact. Yeah, and that, that's, that's why like I like... Glint. That's <laughs> why like I have no shame being like so like 
against or not i don't i don't want to say i was ever really against but have no shame like holding firm on the opposition of Nezarek being who Nezarek now is because it's like if no one is is taking that opposition you're just going to be in an echo chamber and it's just gonna be like oh it's got to be this it's got to be this it's got to be this you know like no one's challenging like the status quo of of the the current lore and that needs to be done don't yep. don't be afraid to say something that seems wrong don't be afraid to be wrong i'm yeah. wrong often I mean, it's just crazy what I've found in this in this community from people that I have no idea who they are. And, you know, maybe yeah. they're really small or maybe they're huge people that have massive influence. But every now and then I'm just like stunned by what people figured out way before. I mean, just one specific uh, scenario off the top of my head, and I've brought it up before, but I remember when everybody was speculating what would, what would the hunter subclass be for for the new void that was happening. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I stumbled upon, and I wasn't even researching now. I was just researching the void like a year after Hunter thing. And I stumbled upon this Reddit thread, which was a year before the Hunter class ever came out. And there was this comment down in there of somebody saying, how awesome would it be if Hunter's got a void bow that could trap people? (laughs) That was a bungee plant. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> there's no fucking the person, way they call the, there's no the person, fucking way they called that that's a plan they called they called it and it was so funny because it wasn't like in detail it's just literally that sentence i mean that person could have ended up working at bungie who knows yeah. you know <laughs> i've 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 actually done stuff like that like back in the day when i was on the the bungie net forums like i yeah i've had like posts and things like that where <laughs> i think um i said i said how uh it was about the stranger's rifle. I could probably find it. I think it was about the stranger's rifle where I said something like, uh, I w- I think it would be cool if the stranger's rifle came back and it was an exotic and it had this like perk that had to do about that had to do with like rewinding time so that it would like give you your ammo back. And that's what it, that's exactly what it like. I had it down to that's the so fucking funny. perk. That's so funny. And then when it came out, someone found the post and they were like, holy shit, I can't believe you called this. And then people were like, so what? It's been announced. And it's like, look at the date, man. Like, this was said in D1. Like, <laughs> this is not recent at all. It's, it, But yeah, those those are fun. And, you know, you, you never know what you'll be right about. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to, this, like, have an out loud thought, please. You know what's funny? <laughs> uh, uh, here, I'm sorry. This is a quick, quick little story. So we got Destiny. I played the part of the Sorry? You know, when Destiny came out, the very you were first just Destiny. Out. Yeah, yeah. So when Destiny first came out, I was a part of that whole beta thing and mm-hmm. played Same. the game before it came out. Yeah, yeah. So I remember playing the beta and my son was little bitty. He walked in the living room when I was, you know, running around with my Exo in the tower and I was looking up at the traveler trying to just look at everything and record as much as I could at, on the, you know, screen or whatever. And, mm-hmm. uh, my son looks up at the traveler and he goes, Whoa, is that an egg? I can't wait to see what dragon came out of that, you know, because it was all cracked. And yeah, like, that's cute. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, God, crazy would that be if the game ended up being the traveler? That was a popular was- theory, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's just so funny how little things like that can just come up and then, you know, who knows? Who really even knows? Exactly. But it, what was so significant about that was like almost maybe a year later, I stumbled upon a quote somewhere in some way, in some book, something where somebody said the universe is the universe is two dragons arguing for an infinitesimal, something like that. It was like the universe is because two are two arguing dragons. I mean, it was just something like that. And I, I thought that was so crazy. Uh, just this thought that the reason why the universe exists is because two dragons are having an <laughs> Yeah. I, I've always held true that the, the universe is actually just turtles, you know, all the way down. <laughs> it's all the way down? 
Yeah, it's just it's turtle. Flavor. It's a it's a turtle stepped on stacked onto a turtle. You know, they just get bigger as they go. Never, you never heard that? No, I have I'm not. I'm trying to remember where I heard it. I, I don't remember where I heard it, but I, I heard it somewhere. <laughs> so, uh, you know, basically, don't discount. Don't, you know, humble yourself, right? Always humble yourself. Always be open to the possibility that there could be nugget of wisdom or information that in anywhere, anyway. Yeah. I, I found not where I heard it from, but I found uh, the real world application. It's, it's the theory that the world actually sits atop four world elephants, which sit atop one world turtle. And then when someone at, this is like wherever, whatever book it was in, they're like, what's beneath the world turtle. And they're like another turtle. And it's just turtles <laughs> all the way down. <laughs> so I got to find that. Um, <clears throat> well, let's get back to the book. Cause we're, we're, yep, yep, we're yep. coming up on our time. Uh, for this, because we gotta we gotta stop short soon. Uh, so the next entry is uh, the Legion Lost section. So so Ido finds uh, Faison and thinks maybe they became a headless one because we know headless ones exist. Glint made them made proof of their existence known. So let's find out where they come from. Not the Fallen, maybe the Cabal. Ido continues Glint's search for an understanding of the Headless One from last year's Festival of the Lost. She, however, has the theory that they aren't Hive in origin, but Cabal. There is a tale about a Cabal Legion, now known as the Lost Legion, who were hunted down by a Hive and ultimately turned into Taken, but through the passing of stories by mouth, the details changed to fit the new narrative. Instead of a simple Hive hunting Cabal down who hid in what would be a lost sector. It was a headless one who then took their heads and left them wandering without. So kind of like, um, just how it happens in like all those like headless horsemen, uh, mythologies where it's like, Oh yeah, yeah, he took your head and then your body's still alive. It's just doing its thing without a head. Um, I know brought this up to Keitel about the lost Legion, the Legion lost and, uh, lost Legion, Legion, Legion lost. Huh? The Legion lost, uh, brought out of the Keitel, who offered little in support of the confirmation of headless ones or that any cabal had continuously flaming heads, though she had her, she, some had their heads on fire for a time. Uh, <laughs> she brought this up to a, but yeah, so, uh, she, she, she said how like, uh, you know, some cabal uh, belched fire. Some cabal ate fire. Some yeah. some cabal had their heads on fire, but not continuously. And uh, so Ida moves on. She brings up the concept of headless ones to a scion, and who, at the mention of headless ones, actually flooded Kaido's mind with memories of one, and that candy exploded out of it when you killed it. So much candy. <laughs> So, so that's like almost like a little bit of an Easter egg too. But it it says if you keep going, uh, crit, she went to a cryptarch to learn that the confetti that also rained after the death of the headless that it was quite a lot, but just standard confetti. Yeah. So, a little Easter egg for Halo people is there was a. Uh, thing in game where you could get a skull in game where when you mm-hmm. shot an enemy grunt it was called grunt birthday skull or yeah. whatever yeah it was, it was grunt so birthday. Any, yeah yeah so any enemy you shot their heads would explode and it'd be confetti and then this like yay would happen at the same time it was kind of annoying but it, it was funny uh that easter egg is in destiny 2 it's in the last wish raid you can put it into yep. the wish wall and any precision hits will have that happen um, but so Lost Legion entry number 14 is actually the conversation with, with the scion. And I think it's a, a, a an interesting conversation. So Ido says, I'm searching for information about the headless ones. And the thought of a creature without a head sent up a spike of adrenaline, a flash of sickening terror that burst into Ido's mind so violently that she jumped the scion's own thoughts only compounded its fear. Ido's eyes widened. 
Oh, I'm screaming, purple flames pouring from empty eyes. I'm so sorry, I... Screaming, a burst of confetti. I didn't mean to. Screaming, candy. Candy everywhere. To upset you. So... (laughs) The Scion apparently had an interaction with uh, Headless One and did not enjoy what was happening. Yeah. And then, um, as you were saying about the confetti, the very next entry is... Uh, she's talking to the Cryptarch, uh, Cryptarch Yareli, who says about 13.2 kilograms. And, uh, Ido says, is that heavy? And the Cryptarch arched the, an eyebrow at her quite heavy for confetti. You say the headless ones emit a shower of this material on death. They do. Ido replied along with an, an edible, the guardians call candy. She tried unsuccessfully to keep the disgust from her tone. The Cryptarch shook his head in disbelief. Aside from its density, which is incredible, this confetti is identical to the stuff humans used during pre-Dark Age celebration. Ido's eyes twinkled with inspiration. Celebrations like the Hall Between, which is the first uh, name drop of yeah. the telephone Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hall uh, of Ween? Yeah, the Hall Between. <laughs> oh, the Hall Between? Yeah, it's the the Hall Between, as in a hall between two rooms. Um, and then so she went to the Cryptarch. She learned about the confetti. Uh, also written for the death of a headless one. And confirmed that it was quite a lot, but just standard confetti. Last, she went to see Lord Saladin, who seemed to be open to the idea of their existence until she mentioned that it came from Glint, at which point he was uh, <laughs> <laughs> was over with the conversation. <laughs> Clint Clint deserves better salad and what the hell, man. Uh, Saladin's like, I don't have time for this crap. Yeah. It's all serious. No, no he, that's actually exactly what he said. He said, I don't have time for this, and Saladin walked yeah. away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. But yeah, so just before that, uh, we get that drop of the the term the hall between so ido is like working it back it's not fallen it's not cabal for whatever reason she didn't think it was hive to begin with and now she's got this like wait a second pre-golden age celebration i need to look into this even deeper than before and so we get to the third section which is uh called findings of ido so this is basically her her big conclusion so, Ido continues her research into the Headless Ones, now that their existence has been proven thanks to Glint. It's now about narrowing down their origins. In the previous sections, she began to look into the Cabal's history to see if they could have them, but that with the help of the Cryptarch, she learned that the Headless Ones predate the Golden Age. Cryptarch met Suo, did some digging, and found that there was a celebration of the Hall Between where children would conceal themselves as monsters to extort treats from neighbors under the threat of vandalism. He also found a researcher of the, of the fourth grade who had written a report on another scientist who had discovered what could only have been a headless one. The scientist in question obviously being named Ichabod Crane. Ichabod Crane, yeah. <laughs> This led Ida to conclude that the Headless Ones were actually created by humanity and were key to accessing the hall between life and death. Boom. So, for anyone who doesn't... Oh my god! (laughs) Sorry, my entire apartment just shook. Oh no. Yeah. I I think everything's fine. I think something heavy just fell. Okay, good. Not in my apartment, but like Somewhere nearby. Close. Yeah. Oh um, my god. This scared the shit out of me. Uh for those who don't know, Ichabod Crane is the name of the guy from the original <clears throat> Headless Horseman uh story. So a fourth grade, not a scientist, not a researcher of the fourth <laughs> grade. Fourth grader, a fourth grader, fourth grader wrote his fucking October Halloween book report on Ichabod Crane. So real quick, all the way back in D1, we have known that the Cryptarch's sole purpose is to aggregate all of the information from before mm-hmm. and try to make sense of it and build um, basically a knowledge base that everybody can pull from to understand what the hell happened or what the heck. 
right, right. They're horrible, yeah. And all of the cryptarchs argue amongst each other about what's real information, what's not information. I mean, they even catalog magazines. Some yeah, that we learned about that last. They catalog year. Playboys last year. Remember? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. With pumpkins drawn on bellies and stuff. And not on the bellies. <laughs> A little bit higher. But also, but also everywhere else. Yeah. Anyway, so it's like the cryptarchs are doing their best to try to figure out what happened before because nobody knows like all the people their brains were wiped their empty slates you know the collapse yeah. all that stuff and so the cryptarchs are doing their best to build an encyclopedia or a knowledge base or whatever but sometimes it's a little bit like google yeah. in that when you go to access it you're like what no this has nothing to do with <laughs> who's putting this information together right and it's a bunch of arguing cryptarchs <laughs> yeah because there's even information that happened that uh, wasn't even specifically from before. It's just somebody threw in there for, for nefarious reasons or whatever. Yeah. And uh, some cryptarchs believe it, you know? So anyway, I just think that's funny because it's like a callback. To <clears> the, <throat> the whole fact that all these people, like, you know, Aris, what's a pineapple, right? You know? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, pineapple? That's a disgusting <laughs> combination. All between? I mean, it's just... But what's funny about that is, like, in between those little jokes, there's always this little nugget of, uh, what do you think? What All would between. actually happen? Right. A, th uh, so like a that. thousand years from now, if society collapsed, what would people think? Yeah, they would just have to go based off of what we left here. Crazy nonsense to anybody. Yeah, uh, so Ida also does some research about pumpkins, uh, yeah. learning that some had two eyes or one eye or less unsettling had four eyes and that they were sentient, which is exciting. <laughs> she learned there were some there was some debate on if they were hunted for food or if being hunted as food caused them to rebel in some way. So, uh, back to the pumpkins, to the headless ones. And so, gathering all of her information, she brings it back to Glint with her conclusion. Uh, Idol also went back to thank Glint for all of his previous work, proving the existence of headless ones, but she had some notes for him. They are, in fact, not headless. It's the opposite, because their heads are their most defining feature. Glint currently attributed their existence to hive origins, likely Nocris, but the proof of them existing pre-Golden Age debunks that theory as well. So, it's not the hive, it's not the cabal, it's not the fallen. She's currently saying it's humanity that's actually created them. And before we had this era of Festival of the Lost, it was the Vex that we were fighting in the Haunted Lost sectors. So I'm well, wondering yeah. if this is all going back to the Vex. What do you think? Well, that's a creepy thought. That the Vex are creating headless ones to give us yeah, candy? Like, yeah, like a whole simulator. Yeah, yeah. right? Like what if what if because that that's that's that makes the most sense to me because there's like there was that tie-in that oh it was the witness that made uh, Faison a headless one and it's like that doesn't make any sense to me why would the witness do that but if it were the Vex creating headless ones there's a reason for it they're studying how we react to these things it's like I, I can actually see it being the Vex if it has <laughs> to be anyone it has to be the Vex. Right. Well, they're the most like. I think that they're the most. Just they could easily fit that if they wanted. I yeah. think it's nice that they don't tell us because it just keeps don't it tell perpetuating. Us huh. Actually. Leave it out. Well, think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Um. So, if we get another festival of lost next year, obviously we will for Lightfall. Lightfall era Festival of the Lost. Then we have uh, Final Shape era Festival of the Lost. So what if next year is the conclusion that Festival of the Lost is being orchestrated by the Vex and Final Shape is like the finale 
of Festival of the Lost in its current form. And it's all about like stopping the Vex from doing whatever it was they were doing. And then in the new era, past light and dark, we get a completely new Festival of the Lost. Is that asking too much? No, I mean, that's that's pretty wild. I like it. That'd be a crazy era of like storytelling over four years in a seasonal (laughs) event. Yeah. Who's listening to (laughs) that's I hope they do that. That sounds awesome. You know, it's funny because, like you said, like just that little nugget uh, in the game, this was all created by. So it's it's funny because it's kind of like a knock on us as players and Mm -hmm. destiny is created by us in in a way or in by, you know, by proxy made by us, the the people playing the game and there's also a lot of fourth wall breaks and that talk mm-hmm. to us specifically it's just funny because it, it kind of like plays with you a little bit saying oh yeah you know you know you could even say like the players like the destiny players in a way we did you know oh we want a halloween event you know we want we want to we want a season event you know that has to do with boopy behavior <laughs> mm-hmm. anyway it's interesting yeah no i mean it is um very excited to see what happens next year uh it's it's been a while since i felt like this is how this is how i used to feel like every content drop in destiny one where it was like oh when where's my new this card because it was like fallen one fallen two fallen three oh yeah and then it was like fallen four and then you'd get fallen five or it was like house of wolves gave us fallen three and then taken king gave us fallen four and i was like i need the next one where is it and now with the destiny's lore books which are great this is the shortcoming of that where I don't really have anything to look forward to because I don't know what to look forward to. There's no catalog. But this no... is now I can look forward to it every year. I can look forward to the next one. Hmm. It's interesting. Well, yeah. it's neat because like they've put these things or well, they're not these things, but they put the lore in book format too. So mm-hmm. that's nice. That's neat. Yeah. I, I I like I like that they play with us continuously throughout the year, just dropping hints, dropping new uh, flesh to put on the bone, if you will. Kind of helps mm-hmm. define what I if you if you were to like glean anything from this particular festival, what would you say that they're trying to t- they're trying to what? What would you say that they're trying to tell you right? Now? Or what would you say that they're foreshadowing? I mean, I think I think it's I think it's mostly isolated. It's it's meant to be a festival of the lost story, and that's that's why I'm like hoping that like if this is a festival of the lost story, that there's a festival of the lost conclusion. And I think in my opinion it makes sense to kind of rebrand Festival of the Lost in the new era, you know, where it's not the headless ones anymore. That story has concluded, and it's like the last one you get is in final shape. That'd be cool. And then we just have some other thing. To- yeah, and then and then this is something else. You know, whatever it ends up being, it's something different. That's fine. Cool. Or maybe yeah, maybe had, uh, well, we Whitefall had is the, the whole, last one. Who knows? Because we had the whole um, what was it called the the haunted. Uh, Haunted Forest. Yeah, the Haunted Forest. I was going to say the Haunted Sectors. Yeah, and so so like maybe maybe in Lightful or maybe in Shadowkeep, like or not just Shadowkeep, uh Final Shape. Holy shit, that was very different. Maybe in <laughs> Final Shape they introduce this new like zone that fits the and this is where festival will now take place from henceforth. You know, um yeah, so I'm 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 excited just to see where it goes. I'm excited. I'm always that's that's how I always leave things with with Destiny. It's just like you know, no matter how much I play or how little I play, I'm always excited to see where things go. I'm I'm in it for the enjoyment, you know. Same, same. That's the whole that's the whole point is 
Um, there, there was a famous uh, quote or anecdote, basically, life. <laughs> Are you talking? You're not saying anything. No, that was it. Did you, life? Did you hear that? Yeah, life is always having something to look forward to. Like the All I heard of was life. life. Oh, it cut out again. Great. Yeah, it cut out. Oh. Like you said, you said life. Nice. So the whole yeah. So the whole poetry is gone. No, basically, life uh, is the meaning of life is having something to look. For. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. Well, that's going to be it for us this week, though, because we are we are right on the time where we got to get going. Uh, yep. So we're we're gonna we're gonna be back. We're gonna be back in two weeks, as we always are. It's gonna be on November twentieth. Uh, yeah. so come hang out with us on November 20th. If you came in late, you want to hear the whole show, it will be posted on anywhere podcasts can be heard shortly. It will also be on our YouTube at loose cannon show on Twitter. Uh, it has a, a pin tweet with like one of those, I think it's called link tree things. And that should just direct you to any, anywhere to get our information. <laughs> so have fun, everybody. Bye.